morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Abby Lee. I'm an attorney with Texas Realtors, and I want to welcome you all to our next installment of the Texas Realtors Legal Series webinars, Ring Ring Who's There? The Law, where our presenter will discuss laws surrounding doorbell, security, and hidden cameras during real estate showings. Um, before I uh, uh, introduce our speaker and turn it over to him, I want to go over a few administrative items. First, uh, there is no CE offered for this webinar. Second, the slides uh, will be available on our website, texasrealestate.com, after the conclusion of today's webinar. We are also <clears throat> recording the webinar today, and that recording will also be available on our website. Additionally, you're going to receive a follow-up email, and there will be a link to the recording in the follow-up email. Finally, if you have questions, go ahead and type those in as we go. We will reserve some time at the end for questions. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Wes Bearden. Uh, Wes is an attorney licensed in both Texas and Louisiana. He serves as CEO and chairman of Bearden Investigative Agency, which was established in Dallas in 1972. He previously served for almost a decade as the general counsel of the Texas Association of Licensed Investigators, and Mr. Bearden currently serves on the boards of the National Council of Investigation and Security Services, as well as the World Association of Detectives. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Wes. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks. I appreciate uh, being here. Uh, that, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, whoop. Uh, is me, just so that you know. I'm going to kind of introduce myself. I am a licensed attorney and, and investigator, a practicing attorney, uh, but most of my, my uh, practice really deals with privacy law, surveillance, uh, investigations when they're surrounding litigation, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I kind of have a pretty good, pretty good handle on this, and, and during this hour today, we're going to try to cover a lot. And I think, I suspect that most of you know what is acceptable. I think most of you know you can't wiretap your neighbor. I think most of you know you can't put a camera in a bedroom and not tell anybody about it. Um, but why you know that may not be as clear. And so part of what we're going to do, I think, for a good uh, 30 minutes here is just understand those rules of audio and video surveillance and how that applies. And then I'm going to try to give you an answer. I know, uh, you know, if you know a lawyer, you... Uh, probably hate the fact that when you when you ask them a question, they say, well, it depends. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> privacy law is one of those things that it always depends. Um, it's, it's a gray area and we don't have very clear lines. But I'm going to try to give you some very basic rules that you can understand and try to apply those to the idea of, of hey, you're showing a house uh, and a seller, whether you represent the buyer or the seller, is, is maybe doing surveillance that they shouldn't be so that you can explain it to them why they shouldn't do what they're doing if it's your client and tell them to knock it off. Uh, or if you see something inappropriate, you can you can deal with it uh, that way. And then we're going to talk a little bit at the very end about something that I think is extraordinarily new that nobody really is talking about right now, which is the evolution of the Ring doorbell and where we're going with Ring and what they have the ability to do because they are about to um, uh, introduce some technology that I think will be a game changer in, in all sorts of industries and might even be uh, the real estate industry. So. Um, let's go to our base rules. You know, um, audio and video are really treated differently. And there's, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, audio has primarily always been governed by the Wiretap Act. And I, you know, the Wiretap Act now is, is the law says you can't wiretap somebody. Uh, we have a federal and state law. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But, it, you know, it's almost 30 something years old. And one of the things that you have an issue with in privacy law, you know, if you're looking today and you read the newspaper, you read about all sorts of things. You read about tracking devices that are used and uh, facial recognition and, and recognition, you know, these license plate cameras. There's all sorts of things that are out there. But the courts are very slow to respond to technology. And if you, you know, if you've ever been involved in a lawsuit, you can just know how long it takes. I mean, it just takes a long time to litigate your case. It takes a really long time to appeal your case and it takes a long time to get a decision about uh, how we're going to deal with certain technologies. And so the courts are lagging behind the times um, by a lot, by 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 decades usually. Uh, but the Wiretap Act is so important to us because it was really the first time that we really went out and tried to protect people's communications. And we didn't try to protect people's property. We really tried to protect their communications. And when that happened, 
that was kind of monumental. And a lot of privacy law that you hear today about all even drones and all these things, we tend to go back to the Wiretap Act and steal uh, those 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 principles and those thoughts on how we we do that. Uh, but that's generally how audio is dealt with. And we'll talk about what the Wiretap Act does and the difference in each state and give you some examples. Video is a little bit different. Video has, um, um, and, and I'm talking about just so we can get clear here moving forward. When I say audio, I mean audio or video with audio. When I say video, I mean just video. I think most of you know, um, and I would bet as real estate brokers you do know, that when people put cameras up in a house or, or warehouse or commercial building or whatever it might be, that those cameras generally don't record audio. Now, I know Ring and some of these others do. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, and those would fall under the audio rules. But most most security cameras that are installed by professionals these days really don't don't uh don't record audio. They don't. They don't transmit audio. They just, you know, they just show the picture from the front of the house or whatever it is. So, but video is a little bit different. Video has a few statutes that are fairly narrow about what you can video and what you can't video. But then it kind of uh, morphs into a common law right to privacy analysis, and that's what I'm sure you have heard everybody in the world say. Well, it's my reasonable expectation of privacy, and so we're going to talk about that. And what that means, and we're also going to talk about maybe some cases that are are a positive of each other, that um, you know could have been decided on uh, either way. Okay, let's talk about the Wiretap Act. We have really two that um, you are bound by, and I'm, I'm assuming all of us here are here in Texas. And the first one is the ECPA, which is Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and that's the federal act. And the second one is the Texas Penal Code. And uh, as you can tell, both of those are, are, are very old, but they're both almost identical in our state. That's not true in other states, and we'll kind of talk about that here in a minute. But for the most part, we, we believe that uh, uh, only one party needs to have consent to, to record or monitor that telephone call. And so let's kind of talk about what that one party rule means. And I, I've explained this for many years to a lot of different clients this way. We're all on the phone call right now. And there's a lot of us. And theoretically, we're all engaged in a conversation. And in a few minutes here, you'll be asking questions. Could you or me record this thing right now without your your knowledge? Uh, yeah, we could. Uh, if you and me are on the telephone together, just just the two of us, can I record it without you knowing about it? In Texas, I can. That's called one-party consent. I, uh, I myself am consenting to that recording. Now, if I drop off this telephone call here right now and... and uh, one of the guys speaks up and says, you know, Abby, this West guy just don't sound like he knows what the hell he's talking about. Um, and that conversation goes on for a little while, and I'm not on the phone. Can I record that conversation? And the, and the answer is no, I cannot. I'm not part of that conversation. And so so that that is what the one-party rule is. That can be difficult to explain to a lot of people, and I would bet that it's difficult, or I have found it difficult, to explain it to Texas people and to probably people who own a lot of property because Texas is a very property oriented state. And in Texas, you know, uh, um, uh, we protect our property rights. I mean, we protect our property rights probably better than any other state. I mean, that's, you know, your homestead rights and, and all sorts of things. And I can't tell you how many calls that I would receive when I was, you know, um, a younger guy said, well, you know, I own these phones. You know, I want to record my employees. I mean, these I pay for the phones. Um, you know, I want to I want to record my kids or my, my wife or, or whatever, uh, and I own it. You know, I bought them. I, I pay the bill on these things, so I should have the right to do that. Well, if you kind of think about that, it's a very property-centric type approach. Um, but that's not really the case. You know, that's not what these laws that we've talked about are, 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 are protecting. That's not what the one party law protects. That protects your, your communication uh, uh, rights, not your property rights, but your privacy rights. So that's a, sometimes very, I know it's a basic thing, but sometimes a very hard thing to, uh, to convince somebody about. Now, as I told you earlier, Texas is uh, the majority in the majority of states who say, hey, we have to have a one party consent. But there are about 10 states that are, uh, and they, these are the 10. And if you look in there, there's a couple of pretty big states, California, Florida. Uh, in fact, you know, in Florida, for many years, you used to go to the University of Florida 
and uh, they they had a sign outside of the classrooms that said it's you know it's state law that you uh, to record your professor without his express permission and uh, uh you know i don't know if they still have that there but but um uh, these states require both parties to consent so if i'm recording it right now and uh, we, we're doing this in California for some reason, and you begin to ask questions and I record it. I've got to say, hey, guys, I'm recording this call for you right now. Um, are you, do you consent to that? Um, and all these states, I would tell you, if you kind of look at them too, um, you know, if you look, they kind of tend to be on the left side of the political spectrum. So they tend to be a little bit uh, states that protect privacy a little bit more than maybe Texas does. Uh, but, um, um, you know, but but you also should be aware that these states aren't all the same. I, I, I would say that some of these have some real goofy provisions. Some say, well, you can't have secret recordings. Well, what's a secret recording? Nobody really knows. Uh, some of them say, well, you have to just announce that you're recording. You don't actually have to get consent. So there's, there's you know, not all these are the same. Probably the best um, example I can give to you about this was one that, uh, that you guys probably remember. I mean, there's all this impeachment talk going on right now. If you remember the last one, we had these two old gals who were talking on the phone about all the ills that Bill Clinton did. And, you know, they were around D.C. area and D.C., of course, is a one party. I believe Virginia is, too. Uh, but Linda, um, who was recording these telephone calls while Monica was making these confessions to her. And I, if I remember correctly, I mean, this is years ago, but I think it was like 20, 30 or 40 hours worth of telephone conversations she recorded. And some of these happen to be in Maryland. And if you look at that last slide, uh, Maryland is a two-party state. And I think, if I remember the facts correctly, that Linda wound up getting indicted in Maryland. I think they dropped it eventually. Uh, but she was indicted for recording the conversations between her and Monica Lewinsky because she didn't get Monica's permission to make those recordings. So you got to be careful where you're at. Um, you know, here, I, I'm assuming we're all in Texas, but... You know, realize that uh, you leave the state lines, the law changes a little bit. Okay. Now, I said that you have to have consent. And now here's where the maybes of the lawyer come in. Well, consent can kind of be not necessarily express. Um, it can be implicit. And there are a handful. And I've only listed a few here, but uh, times where, where you can get consent from an implicit uh, uh, act. And now I would not, as a business owner rely on these um, these are very very narrowly driven and these are very 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 small little little limbs that the court will let you go out on the first is something that's kind of developed really here in recent years and it's really developed now in most states i mean uh, uh, texas has a case that was out of fort worth that really did it but it's called vicarious consent uh, and it's it's the idea that you can consent for your your child you can record your child's conversation uh, with somebody else. Um, what the court has said is that you just can't do that. You know, if you're if you're you know divorced and you're sending the kid over and you you know, slap a microphone on them, you can't do that just to listen to what you know the husband's saying. Um, you can't. You're not allowed to do that. But but you can do it when you think that there's a best interest of the child standard uh, out there. The majority of these cases, and there are there are now a couple of handfuls of them out throughout the United States are generally cases where mom or dad has thought that their, you know, uh, early teenage daughter uh, or son, I guess, has been on the phone engaged in uh, conduct that they shouldn't be with an adult. And so they, without the adult's knowledge and without the kid's knowledge, begin, you know, recording the telephone calls and find out that there is an inappropriate relationship and then wind up going to the police department. And the courts have, have generally said in those cases, I think in all those cases so far, hey, you know, that's okay. You can do that. You know, we, you're trying to protect, protect the kid um, physically, and that's, that's, that's fine to do. The second one is in the ordinary course of business. And I can't tell you how many times I've had a, a businessman misinterpret this. They'll call, well, it's the ordinary course of my business to record all my telephone calls coming into this office because I want to know what the hell's going on. Well, I, I understand that. I, you know, I I I I, I run a business myself. I, I don't know what. Uh, sometimes we don't know what the left hand is doing from the right hand. But that's not what this covers. This covers those professions that are clearly um, needing to do that. And 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 the typical ones: nine one one operator, uh, the security or the alarm operator. You know, who has to record all the calls coming in because they're distress calls usually. 
and we need those because they're going to result in some type of criminal or some type of civil litigation or some type of a routine routine deal. And I tell you, that's a very small, so if you're thinking, well, maybe I could fall under that, I would tell you it's probably not going to happen. The third that I've given here, and I'm not saying that these are the only three, but these are the three biggest ones that I always, always kind of think about, uh, is a jailhouse, right? You're sitting in the jailhouse, uh, um, you know, Bob, your friend's across from, from you in the mirror, you're on the phone, and you're talking about all the, the problems he's had. Well, you know, those conversations there are probably going to be monitored by the sheriff's department. There are a lot of states now who said, you know, you, you kind of give that right up. You know, we, we have a right to kind of hear what's going on. We're trying to keep people safe. We're trying to keep people uh, that are dangerous in the big house here. So we have a right to monitor those conversations. Uh, not all states have said that, but a lot of them have. And, and so those are times when can kind of consent the, uh, can be implicit. Now, here's how I'm going to change it again. I'm going to say, well, sometimes you don't even need consent. And um, this is where the reasonable expectation of privacy kind of comes in in a lot of lot of sense. Um, and it comes from this case called CATS, which is now um, uh, very old. In fact, it's about a phone booth, as you can see there on the right. And it's, uh, well, there it says right there, mid-1960s. So that tells you how old this thing is. And we have all sorts of cases after cats that uh, expand it, limit it, uh, talk about it, and 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 you can um, uh, invalidate it to some degree. But cats really is the people that come up with, uh, or the court that comes up with this reasonable expectation of privacy. Here's the facts: the guy's in a phone booth, and the FBI decide, you know what, we're going to wiretap that phone booth and hear what he's talking about uh, because he's in public and he's having public conversations, and he can't have any expectation of privacy goes up to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court says, yeah, you know what, he can, because we actually believe that you can have a, 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 you know, we believe that he had a subjective expectation of privacy because he was in a phone booth and he shut the door and he didn't think anybody in there was listening to him. And we as a society are re kind of prepared to recognize that, you know, when you're in a phone booth having a private conversation, then that's probably reasonably private and we need to protect that. And so that's where this test comes from, and we use this test now in all sorts of things uh, when it deals with, with privacy law, or we use a version of it in, in, in some form of another. But this is where you've heard that. So let's talk about that in terms of conversations, and, and um, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, and, and, and it's not a, this is the depends part of the, the lawyer in me, you know, it's not a uh, clear cut when you say, I'm recording conversation, can I do it? So. So let's give you some examples. You know, if, if you're in a restaurant and you're talking to the buyers and you're talking as loud as you can or, the, you know, and, and screaming and, and you get into a fight or whatever, you know, you can't have a reasonable expectation that that, uh, that conversation is going to be private, right? I mean, everybody can hear you. Do you have a reasonable expectation if you're sitting in the back booth and you lean over the uh, table and you whisper in their ear, you know, this is, this is a pretty good price. We ought to take this deal. Um, yeah, you might have that reasonable expectation of privacy. You might find a court that does that and might say, you know what, we, we, we don't think that listening in on that is appropriate. Um, you know, loud talking on the front lawn. You know, if you're um, uh, uh, you're talking about the house on the front lawn, the neighbor overhears you. If you're doing it out in public and you're not trying to protect yourself from uh, that intrusion, uh, then, yeah, it's probably a fair over here. Um, and this just kind of makes sense, right? Doesn't it make sense that if you're sitting at a cocktail party and two guys are talking about the deal behind you and you overhear it because they're drunk and a little loud? Um, have you broken the law? Do you need to turn yourself in? No, you know, no, you don't. You, 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 uh, you, you know, they, they've kind of abandoned whatever expectation of privacy that they, they might have. What about in a vacant home? Well, you know, I don't see many courts have addressed this, but I would tell you this. I think that I would reasonably expect that number one, you had a subjective expectation of privacy. I think, I think that you would for audio. Why? Because that's why you have the showing the way you show. You know, most showings don't have the seller there, so uh, or anybody there. So that you know, you, you believe that that your conversations within that home are, are generally private. Uh, I would also say that it's fairly reasonable as a society that when you're in somebody else, even if you're in somebody else's home. That you expect, you know, some of the conduct in somebody else's home to be remain uh, remain private. So I think when it comes to audio conversations, that's probably pretty well protected there. What about when you get in public? Well, one of the the uh, 
test here that I, I put, and you can look at that, but this is how the courts, when, you, when you're on that line, you know, we've gone from yelling in a restaurant to whispering in the back booth uh, to talking loud out on the, uh, on the uh, uh, front porch to being in the home. How do courts get to, yeah, this is a violation or this is not? Well, they, they get to it a lot, you know, every court comes to its own conclusion, and many times the conclusions are opposite of each other, and that, that happens. In fact, we've got a couple of cases we're going to show you that that happens pretty regular. But here's the things that the court looks at. The volume of the communication. Were you yelling or were you whispering? The pro proximity of, uh, of poten or potential of other individuals to overhear the conversation. If you're in a restaurant, that's a lot different than if you're in the backyard of somebody's house talking. Um, the potential of the communication to be reported. Um, <clears throat> you know, how, <coughs> excuse me for a minute there. Um, uh, you know, can somebody report that type of communication to, you know, to somebody else? Are you able to see it? Well, did you have anything to shield your privacy? So did you, you know, whisper? Did you put your hand over your, uh, his ear? Uh, did you write it down on a piece of paper? The need for technological advancements. Um, you know, years ago, if you if you if you look at it, uh, there's a number of cases where, and you would see this in old 1980s movies, you know, where the guy would be walking around and and they'd have it was usually in a spy movie somewhere, and they, this guy would have this huge boom mic point, pointed to the bad guy, and he's trying to overhear what the conversations are, or whatnot. Uh, well, you know, courts have kind of found that, you know, listen, if you can record it with just a normal recorder that would be like you're hearing, that's okay. But if you're using these boom mics and you're using these these laser mics and all this stuff, you know, we, we don't think that's necessarily fair. That's that's technological advancements. It needs to be as if you were overhearing it yourself. Um, I, I never understood how they could keep that boom mic secret or why nobody else would look around and say, what the hell is going on there? But anyways... Um, the place and the location of the communication as it relates to the subjective uh, belief, you know, you know, look, I, I believe we went into this house and we were the only people in there and that what we said to our real estate broker was private. Um, you know, was it? Who knows? But that was my belief. And, and the courts take that into account. So you need to kind of look at that. Here's a couple of cases I found in Texas. And I, I use these because I think they're good cases. They kind of come out in some ways like cases I'm not sure I'm not sure if I was a judge that I'd go one way or the other. Um the first is kind of a it was kind of a well known case here in the DFW area. But um grandmother and the father of a murdered child, uh they bring an action because basically they're at the funeral service for their for, for the kiddo. And the police, you know, they kind of think that maybe some of the family had something to do with this kid's death. And so what they do is they go install a wiretap at the urn of the uh the grave and the purpose of that uh, wiretap is to hear what the family says when they come up and give a grave time confession and talk and so they record these things and try to get them admitted um and court actually goes okay yeah we, we we're probably gonna let these admit but but they say you know the lawyer here was didn't have the, they didn't have the best lawyer on the grandmothers and the father and the family side because they didn't really um, get some testimony about the subjective intent. You know, they, they should have listed some testimony that said, hey, you know what? We were there. We were giving our prayers. We huddled as a family in front of the urn. We talked to each other. We didn't want anybody else to hear that. And and, and I, I think if they had done that, I think I would, as a judge, have said, you know, listen, you know, that, that that's a private moment. Um, you know, you could equate this to the, the wedding, right? When When the bride comes down the aisle and and uh, father uh, gives over the, the bride to the new son-in-law, and then, you know, they usually say a few things. Well, you know, we know that those things are usually I love you's and this, that, and the other, but but we, we still kind of respect the privacy of those things because that is an intimate moment. So it's kind of an interesting case in that regard. Not sure that um, uh, another court wouldn't have gone another way, and I think that they fairly could have. Uh, second one is kind of a, uh, was a case down in Houston I think it was a, a fairly interesting political case. A reporter goes to a hotel, and, and I believe the hotel was one that had uh, kind of a, you know, a, a big area where there was a, uh, a number of tables where people ate breakfast and stuff like that and, and kind of hung out. And this reporter rec records a, 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 uh, a conversation amongst some politicians uh, using just a regular tape recorder, I think, off of his phone, unenhanced. And um, uh, he gets sued over it. And they say, you know, you wiretapped us. 
And the court says, doesn't really make a decision here. It says, you know what? It could be a wiretap. It could violate the wiretap act. Depends on, you know, where the, where the, uh, uh, political types trying to sit at a table by themselves. Were they off at the corner? Were they whispering to each other? Uh, but if they were just there and talking in their normal voices and he as lo- and everybody else who was around that area overheard what they were talking about, you know what? That's a fine. That's fine, too. You, you know, that that's a good recording at that point. So as you can tell, these are real fact intensive and you don't get a real good answer all the time. So let's let's get to the showing. Can you record the audio of a showing if you're the seller and you're not there? Likely not. Unless you're part of the conversation, which is almost never the case, you probably can't do that. So just kind of be, you know, I think that's that's I think most of you know that. Um, but maybe why we why that was is it was was a little fuzzy. Um what about cameras? Now I told you, you know, wiretap act doesn't apply to cameras. It, it, it's, it, you know, it, 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 uh, it only applies to audio and com- uh, conversations and com- communications. Well, video is not really a communication under the law. I mean, it is a, it's a picture. Uh, but when you take the audio out of it, which normally is what what you have in most of these real estate situations, it doesn't fall underneath that. Um, now we have some statutes. Um, that actually do deal with it. And a couple of these you probably know because they deal with some uh, real estate issues. Um, number one is a proper photography and visual recording. We've had this statute on the book for a long time here in Texas. Basically, uh, this statute says, hey, listen, you can't put a camera um, and record for lewd or lascivious purposes another individual. Um, and we've had that. I doubt we've had very many people prosecuted underneath it. Um, there's a reason for that. I mean, we're in Texas. Unless there's a lot of blood or guts, we just don't prosecute a lot of crimes uh, that are that are privacy related crimes. But it has happened, I'm sure. And and uh, that that's one of them. The second is peeping tom. We don't have that many peeping tom laws here in Texas, but you know there are a lot of states that do, and a lot of states that say you can't record off, you know, uh, on somebody's property or on this part of that property or that or the other. Um, so that tends to be where that that comes from. Um, uh, and, and again, if you ever look at those laws, they're very limited. Revenge porn. We recently did this, um, and it got turned over. And um, I, I, I uh, uh, testified actually in the legislative uh, legislature on this this uh, law, and uh, I mentioned that I believe that it was probably unconstitutional, and, and the courts found it was, but. But this is a, a law that says, hey, you know, if you're going to take intimate photographs, which uh, if you decide to do that, you can't turn around and post them online when you get upset. Um, and so, you know, we do have some of these video laws. One that you should be aware of is the drones. You know, drones um, now, I, I think real estate brokers now have an exemption under the drone law, uh, which is which is impressive uh, because a lot of people who wanted exemptions under the drone law were not able to do so. And much of what the federal government has has said now is that, yeah, we're going to regulate some of the drones and how you get a license to fly them. But when it comes to privacy issues, we're going to just push that and kick it right back down to the state. And the state has basically said you can't use a drone to spy on somebody. I think you have an exemption for for real estate brokers when they want to show law, you know, pieces of property or whatnot. Um, but but the but but using it to to go out and and check on somebody and see what they're up to and what they're doing, you're not allowed to do that. And that's what this this statute does. It was very interesting about this statute and how it affected law enforcement because law enforcement was caught up in that. They wanted a an exemption, weren't able to get it right off the bat. So very interesting. Um, so those are the really the statutes as we talk about them. You know that's that's uh, you know if you want to look up a statute. Uh, in terms of video, that's some of them, and, but most of them all are, are, are similar to that. They're very kind of narrow in, in purpose and what they're trying to protect and everything like that. Um, what you worry about is is this invasion of privacy. Now, I don't get too much into it because it kind of gets kind of complicated and it gets a little dense for uh, you know 10 a.m. in the morning. But invasion of privacy works hand in hand with the Wiretap Act and most most of these acts acts most of these acts allow you you know you you not only commit a criminal act but if you do violate the wiretap act gives you a remedy to sue have somebody sue you and uh, ask for damages Uh, but the common law version of that which almost is replicated in any statute is invasion of privacy which i'm sure you've all heard of Um, invasion of privacy you'll see people sued for it 
Um, and, and there are a ton of invasion of privacy cases um, involving video and audio, but most, a lot of them are, are, are uh, good for the video so that we can understand the rules. And it requires basically these three elements. Number one, that you intruded on somebody's uh, solitude, seclusion, or their private affairs, okay? And, um, uh, you know, so you did something, whether it's place the wiretap, place the video camera in the room, um, you know, monitor them with a tracking device, monitor them, uh, you know, uh, duplicate their phone, uh, whatever it is. Uh, number two, that it would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. Well, I hate to tell you guys, but that's about as gray an area and test that you can imagine. What's highly offensive? You know, what's highly offensive to me versus you is probably, uh, you know, five miles apart. I mean, we we really don't know, and and that's why these cases are a little bit uh, hard to prove and hard to defend because the, the reasonable person is going to be thought of to be the juror, or they're going to think they are. And you know, what is that juror thinking? Who knows? And that you got some injury as a result. You, you had some some injury. But generally, you know, if, if, if you find one or two, you're going to have an injury, you know, whether it's a comp, you know, a dollar value that's worthwhile, maybe may something else to think about. Um, here's a whole bunch of cases about this, and I think these kind of illustrate the point. Probably one, and I've tried to find them as to be homes, if you will, but one of the, one of the ones is, that I always liked is this Clayton case, and it's out of Texarkana. So here's what the Clayton case is. This old gal thinks that her husband is stepping out on her. And uh, so she decides she's leaving town for the week, uh, and she um, uh, goes in and hires a guy to put a camera in the bedroom of the house that's hidden. And he's having an affair, and um, for some reason, he decides that the place he needs to bring her back to is the marital bedroom, which sounds like a really bad idea for all parties involved in this deal. And so she catches him. And he confronts her, or she confronts him and says, hey, you know, I, I, I saw the video and, you know, I, you know, I want a divorce and all this other stuff. And he turns around and brings this lawsuit or this claim saying that you invaded our privacy. And the court says, you know what, uh, he's a pretty bad guy and we don't really much like him bringing people into the marital home to do that. But you probably did. He prob you probably did invade his privacy. And they say, you know, and, and you remember, that's the the big point that you it's hard to get through to people's in, in their mind is that hey this is my property i'll do what the hell i want with it because we're texans that's what we want but that's not what the court's allowing here you know the court is saying listen you know this guy may be married and you know by virtue of him being married you do rel relinquish some of your privacy you do but you don't relinquish all of it you don't get to be under video camera 24 hours a day seven days a week you know, and so he had some expectation. Well, what he was doing was not right, but he did have some expectation of privacy in there. And I would tell you that if they found that, that maybe that they would even find that she, that the girlfriend had an expectation of privacy in there too, because she thought that there was nobody in that bedroom. Kind of think about those facts. It kind of goes right to a, a buyer seller type deal. As a buyer, you kind of have an expectation that you're the only people there and you're not being watched all the time. Okay. Um, these are the open windows cases. Um, they're out of Tyler and Austin, and I think they're great cases because they show you how this stuff is so gray and two, two courts can get to different areas. First case says, uh, uh, apparently, um, uh, you know, these neighbors are in a dispute with each other. A neighbor looks over and sees this guy in a plate glass window, basically and you know takes a picture of him or, or observes him standing inside his house doing something i get the impression that you know let's just say this guy was was out there and and in his shorts in the in the house and he looks up and sees him over in the in the uh in the house through the window and of course says, you know what uh you you can't expect to be secluded if you're standing in front of a huge window uh, with the blinds opened and you know your neighbor looks out and sees you you can't do that i mean you know i mean you should have shut the shut the blinds i mean have some common sense then we get down to this one in, in Austin, and I think if you look at the dates here, they're about year, three years apart. Um, this one in Austin is go, reaches the opposite. Uh, landowners next to a, a guy, and I get the feeling these are kind of uh, zero lot line type properties. And uh, he he uh, he's apparently ticked off at his neighbor. Uh, his neighbor's got a dog's barking in the backyard, and just uh, so he wants to take a picture of it so that he can send it to the 
uh, uh, animal control people and say, hey, this dog's out of control. Y'all need to get over here and he's he's damaging my fence or whatever. So he reaches up, takes a photograph, and while he's doing that early one morning on a Saturday, for about 10 seconds, he sees the neighbor who is about uh, eight months pregnant wearing only her pajamas in a plate glass window. And he takes a picture of it uh, that's part of the picture. And the court says, you know what? That is an invasion of privacy. Now, think about that. We had an old guy who was in a plate glass window in his shorts, and that was an invasion of privacy. We did have an invasion of privacy when it was an eight-month gal pregnant through the window uh, of a next-door neighbor. Uh, now, now there, there are maybe some facts that differentiate the two, but some of it, it may not be as, as clear to me as, as it is others. Maybe it's that you know, he's kind of a weird old dude on, on one and the other one's, uh, well, she's, she's a nice little gal. So, you know, these courts are trying to make the decisions they can. But the, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, these are a lot of judgment calls and they, they are gray areas. Um, I think the court in this one maybe did a little bit different because they said, you know, he was, you know, her, her window was really not coming out to the front yard. It was coming out to the side yard. And uh, that's a little bit more protected. I'm not sure I buy that argument, but that's what this court said. So, um, anyways, I mean, you can see there, you know, these are a lot, a lot of judgment calls. So let's talk about your general rules, whether you're dealing with um, showings or you're not. Um, and these are my rules, and these are not real court rules. So don't take this slide and say, I, I see I did it and I could have done it um, because it's not really true. The test is really the same. If you really look and see, you know, the reasonable expectation of privacy test is the same, but there is a little difference here. And Jaron, I said, you know, you can't have audio. You can't record people. And, and I think everybody here knows that. And, and there's a long tradition in American law that says you can't, right? We protect attorney-client privilege. We we protect your privilege, uh, your your patient privilege. You you get to talk to your doctor without everybody knowing. You we protect your marital privilege. You get to tell your your spouse at home in bed what you think about X, Y, and Z, and you can't. We're not allowed to get to it. You know, we we have a long history of audio recordings, illegal illegal wiretaps, and 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 our nation's been through a lot of that. Every, you know, from J. Edgar Hoover to to FBI cases to to all sorts of things. And so I think generally you guys know that unless there's really no expectation of privacy, okay? And there are some places, and, and really, in my mind, I think you need to keep the burden on that. Hey, it's outside, it's in a restaurant, it's screaming and yelling, it, it, and it may be in things that you do. I, we had a case not long, um, several years ago, where, uh, and I believe it was a realtor that was talking on her phone in her car after the show, and the neighbor overheard what was being said. Well, it was, you know, if you think about it, she had the, the volume of the Bluetooth phone thing turned up to, uh, you know, pretty high decibels. So if you're walking down the sidewalk, you could overhear that. Is that a is that an intrusion? Well, I think it's going to be a judgment call, but I kind of tend to think that she hasn't made real good efforts to try to try to protect herself because most people know that's possible. Most people have walked by a car that, that you, you're able to hear the inside conversation because they have the speaker so loud. So, you know, be aware of that. Generally, you can't have video, and you know most. I think most of you know that you know most professional video guys nowadays are putting these things in. Don't put audio in them, and you can have video uh, of certain areas. But you know where there's no you know a reasonable expectation of privacy, you got to start to to uh, begin to worry about that. So let's talk about a home. Where is that? Well, I would say that's the bathroom. I would say that that's the bedroom. I think we all can agree that your bathroom and bedroom are kind of sacrosanct areas. What about, uh, you know, outside? I believe outside, probably not. I believe that you have a right to, you know, have videotape out of your backyard. Um, um, you know, a lot of people do that to keep an eye on the pool or whatever you need to. What Your entry point areas, I think you can have video cameras on those, what, such as a foyer or, or, or whatnot. Can you have one in the living room? And that's the question that everybody likes to ask. I think generally you can in most courts. I think most courts would allow that here if it doesn't record audio. Uh, but I'm not, you know, you have to understand it's going to be a, 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 a slight area. And there are a lot of homes that I think of now that have, you know, kind of mother-in-law suites. Uh, or areas where, you know, mom says, well, this is my private area, my private little, uh, uh, you know, living room. Uh, I would say that there's a pretty darn good argument that, you know, we might have been a dining room table society 60 years ago, but now we're a TV and living room society. And that's where most of our living occurs and we ought to protect it. 
So I, I think you need to be kind of careful about that if you're going to tell people to, you know, to do that. Now they have a good reason that may help help mitigate that. You know, if they're staffed, if there's uh, whatever, then you've got a chance. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> so what about ring? Well, um, basically, you know, ring as a whole, I think, is generally okay. Most of these cameras are mounted on the outside. They do record uh, your audio conversations. I think the the issue where you get into is can you listen onto a conversation from the for front porch of two people talking that you're not part of? And I, I I've got to tell you I, I've looked for cases to see if anybody's tried to exclude this in a criminal case or or whatnot, and I haven't seen it yet. Um, usually because by the time they get to the front porch they pretty much committed the crime, and the last thing they're worried about is trying to keep out the the audio. But uh, um, you know I think that you are probably pretty fair game. Uh, conducting your video there, as long as you're not videoing, you know, uh, into somebody's house across the street, and you're only catching the front area. Most of the guys who are setting this up know that and purposely set these cameras up so that it only really captures your property. Um, but then you get this, and I think that this is kind of an interesting thing that I think is probably legal, uh, but I, I, I think ought to raise some concerns by everybody. Uh, and this, if you look here, this is a Washington Post article that did not, is not that long ago. And um, I think it's, you know, a couple months ago. And uh, basically, it, it, it's confirming Ring has partnered up with about 400 police departments um, in a surveillance program. Now, every department differs on what they're willing to do, but it allows the government, basically, to link your, your doorbell to their system through Ring. And they can send you an email and say, hey, listen, we had a kidnapping or we had somebody who looked suspicious or we had something we need to use your ring doorbell for. And it would email you to your app and you could reply back. Yeah, you can have the video. Now, they really haven't talked about whether they get the audio and that might be kind of critical later on. But it allows them to participate in that and, and you can send the video then to them so that they can look at it. OK, now the government, certain governments. I, I know in, in uh, up here in DFW, I think one of the departments is Plano, and I, I don't think that they're allowing this in Plano, but I do think in some departments they are. They, they Ring is actually giving them the doorbells, and the government is saying, "Well, listen, we'll we'll install this Ring doorbell for you if if you pro, uh, participate in the program." That will be interesting, and that'll be interesting to see how they're doing that and whether or not there's some real consent to that. There's some real understanding that people are giving up their privacy rights to put this Ring doorbell on and that the government's going to be able to, to ask them for it. Uh, Ring is still going to allow programs so that somebody can pay to have their, their doorbell monitored 24 hours a day. We'll talk about how they intend to do that here in a minute, which is very, very, uh, very interesting. Uh, Amazon. Uh, who now owns Ring, you know, Ring got sold to Amazon, and say, well, you know, they're going to protect all our customer information, information unless a search warrant or court order is issued. Uh, but they haven't really talked about that. And, and you know, you're, you're, you're betting that this big company is going to notify you when the, they serve that court order, which I don't think they have to. Um, I think if you, you're familiar with the criminal justice system, getting a search warrant, a court order nowadays is, uh, I don't think, particularly hard if they have a decent uh, decent reason. So it is It is a little scary that they're combining with the police departments to do this type of stuff. 57 are in Texas. And so here's the ones that I have that I'm showing right now that are participating in Texas. And if you look at them, I bet most of you on this call are in these areas right here. Uh, Houston, DFW, and Austin, San Antonio, up and down 35. Um, some states, look, I mean, you know, New Mexico and, and uh, Louisiana, I think really don't have hardly any, uh, but Texas is really bought into this, and it's it's a very interesting interesting thing. How are they going to recognize all this stuff? And here's some things to kind of paranoia out a little bit. Amazon has been has had, and they sell this this software. You know, Amazon's now kind of branched out and and put their tentacles in a lot of different markets, and one of them is called recognition. Now, recognition is facial recognition basically but it's 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 also textural recognition you know being able to recognize characters on the on a video screen um it does movement tracking there there are some real benefits to this thing in a lot of different industries for instance 
you know, live football games and stuff like that. You can track certain movement. Um, you can you can search through video a lot quicker that uh, you may take if you're you're in production or whatnot. Uh, and so they they've been developing that and they've been developing it pretty well. Last year, Ring filed a patent application and now they 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 kind of backed off. Or, well, well, let me say this: they filed a patent application that would alert when they found somebody who was suspicious. Uh, to be observed on your ring doorbell camera. Um, now they they kind of came out with with uh, some press articles kind of backing off that a little bit, but uh, that that you know they were they were not automatically employing it, and there was going to be some safeguards and all this other nonsense. But the problem there is, what is suspicious? I mean, what's suspicious in your neighborhood? You know, I, I would bet you suspicious in Highland Park might be different than suspicious in in, in Fort Worth. Um, you know, in, in El Paso or wherever. Um, and how do you know who is suspicious? I mean, you can see that there's some really weird criminal profiling issues there that make it very um, problematic. Now they are moving to this idea of facial analysis. So not only they're trying, you know, this is not recognition. This is not saying that we see uh, Sue there in front of your house. This is saying we see somebody and we believe Sue is happy and they're basing it based on what the camera sees and analyzes as happy. That's how they're going to come up with suspicious. Um, and how do they do that? You know, I mean, this a lot of this right here comes directly from the Ring um, uh, Amazon uh, uh, website for recognition, not, not from Ring. They don't they don't advertise that. But. Uh, from Amazon, they're talking about, hey, well, her eyes are open, she's smiling, she's happy, uh, your forehead's uh, uh, not raised, there's you know no no ruffles, whatever, no wrinkles, whatever. So they, you know, that's how they're determining this emotional character of it. Um, recently, they said, you know, we've got a new emotion that we can put in there, which is fear. So who's going to monitor that? Who's going to tell me when I'm afraid? And if I'm afraid, what are they going to do about it? And it, it is kind of a scary, scary technology. So, you know, as, as I, I'm going to make sure that I have some time here left for to talk to you, uh, if anybody has any questions here, and I've got about probably 10 or 15 minutes, but can, can let's think about how that would apply to you guys, because I think there are some retailers seriously thinking about this. If you're at a retail or if you're at a, a real estate showing, could you purchase or could you take the recordings of the buyer's photos? that were legally obtained, right? They were legally obtained from from uh, the ring doorbell outside the residence, maybe from the backyard. Run those through in an uh, emotion database before and after the showing. Could you take those, uh, and I'm not sure this technology exists just yet, but I, I, I don't think we're too far from it. And could you take those and say, you know, well, we've had 25 people who've come to visit 123 Elm Street and every time they go to the backyard and look at that old crappy outdoor kitchen, they they start to you know ruffle their 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 uh, uh, face and it looks like they're concerned, you know. And in fact, the computer says that, that they're concerned at that location. Can we take that and use that uh, to to tell the buyer or the seller you need to redo this? Well, maybe, maybe. I think that there are some retailers who are thinking about doing this type of software type of analysis when you've got people in the public place looking around a clothing store or looking around any type of store that, that's in there. I think that the cost of doing this is probably pretty high right now. Uh, but as we all know, you know, technology and, and money, uh, you know, the further it runs, the lower it costs. So, it, you know, there, there's a chance that's going to come down at some point in time. Um, now, could you still do that within the house? I don't know. I mean, you're still going to run a, run afoul of those privacy laws, but but that's a real real interesting thing to be thinking about. Now, we've kind of been doing this, right? We've been doing this in customer service for years. You know, you've usually had a manager at the restaurant who kind of looks around and makes sure that everybody in the restaurant sitting at the at the table and looks very happy and has not you know crossed their arms and you know scowling at the uh, uh, waitress because they haven't gotten their their bill or whatever. Uh, so we've been kind of doing this, you know, the Secret Service. That's their number one um, thing when the president comes out to be shown. You know, you, you see multiple Secret Service. Those guys aren't all there to protect the president, but what they're doing there is they're looking at people's faces and trying to say, you know, we're supposed to be at a happy, good luck, go lucky rally for X, Y, and Z, and 
and this old guy looks like his, you know, his, uh, uh, he, he's about to do something rash. So we've kind of been doing this, but now we're going to have the computer do it. And it is kind of scary. I think legally, if it was done in the right way, particularly if it's a ring camera on the outside of the house and you're, you're, you're only you know, capturing what you legally have been uh, available to do, I think it's probably fair. But, um, um, but, but it'll it'll be interesting, and I think you're going to see some some battles. Do I think the courts will ever get to this in the next uh, five years? Probably not. Uh, but eventually, uh, and that that kind of shows you how 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 far advanced these things are. I'm a few minutes early, so I'm about ten minutes early, and I did that. So if there's any questions, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, I'll be, be more than well willing to try to answer them as best I can or uh, make something up for you. So, <laughs> can I help anybody well, have all- anything? Yeah, we've got a few questions here. That's all great information and really interesting about the facial recognition uh, issue. Um, uh, one question we have here is, you know, we hope that sellers will comply with the laws and requirements, um, but if they don't, are there any tips uh, or advice that you have for buyers that perhaps a buyer's agent could convey to a buyer? You know, hey. You know, you may want to have conversations and X, Y, Z. Um, any tips that you have? Yeah, yeah. Two things. First off, yes, have conversations with your your clients before you get there. You know, uh, and and listen. Let's look through, see what you want to see. You know, but but when we we need to have a real talk about something, let's go and and do that uh, elsewhere. And elsewhere doesn't mean out in the front lawn, uh, because you know these ring cameras are, are what uh, are recorded can record audio. Uh, you can listen into, but also I, I would tell you that you know, you've got neighbors there and everybody knows each other. So you need to get get away from the house. That's the first thing. Second thing um, that uh, is kind of interesting, uh, and I've learned over the years, is that you know the sound of running water. I mean, it is uh, almost the same audible as your conversations. And uh, it, you know, when you turn on a faucet, it almost masks. You know, you try it at home sometime. It masks what what people are saying. It makes it very difficult. And microphones have very difficult time picking that up. You know, we have some new microphones and everything, but most of the most of the devices that are out there today are still using old condenser type microphones. I mean, I, I mean, I, I I would say that. So, but but the the better deal is is look, get away from the home, make your conversation, and and you know you're going to have to point some things out, and and that's going to have to happen. But you know, when it comes to your your detailed negotiations or or tactics or whatever you're going to do. You know, get a, get out of that neighborhood. Don't don't do it there. Great. And and just I'll encourage everyone once again, if you've got questions, go ahead and type those in. Um, we've been getting a few questions, and I'll I'll take this, but a few questions about the recording and the slides. Um, yes, we will make those available um, on our website, both the slides and the recording of today's webinar, and you'll also receive a link to a recording um, in the follow-up email that you receive at the at the end of the the webinar. Um, another question uh, we have uh, here is. Is there any benefit, uh, let's say a seller's agent notices a seller has uh, cameras in the property and talks about, you know, hey, you may want to be aware that there could be some legal issues with this, um, but the seller just doesn't want to to remove uh, the the camera. Um, Is there any benefit to disclosure of cameras? Would that affect the reasonable expectation of of privacy, for instance? Well, sure. Sure. Yeah, I think you need it. Yeah, I think I think so. If you were able to disclose the cameras and where they're at, and, and look, here's the cameras that you got to be worried about. The, the the cameras you're worried about are not the ones that are installed by uh, you know, ABC Video or, or whoever, um, or even the Best Buy Video guys or whoever's coming down to do those that are a professional company that's doing it. They they know these rules and they kind of err on the side of conservative than than uh, than anything else. The, the guys you have to worry about are the guys who've gone on about a co- camera system. With audio in it from Sam's or you know uh, uh, Micro Center or some type of uh, electronic store that's just selling these things you know in wholesale and he's installed it himself. That's what you really are looking for, and those are the ones you've got to say. Uh, you know, let me ask you, how'd you do that? You know, if they say, well, I've hired somebody to put the cameras up and I, I have cameras. Well, okay, great. And that's probably something you need to disclose. You know, it wouldn't be bad for you to disclose it to them. I mean, that's a selling point to me. But um, for the ones that he's installed personally, I think you need to ask, you you got to ask some questions. And um, you know, are you able to record audio? Are you able to monitor the audio? Okay, well, we need to probably take that down during this time. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to un- uninstall them. 
that may just mean that you just need to unplug the back of the uh, uh, the cameras going into the DVR or whatever they're they're doing at the time, and um, uh, and it may mean that you need to disclose that to the uh, uh, to the buyer too. So, gotcha. Um, here's a question: um, Is there anything as a seller's agent, um, without of course running afoul of, of unauthorized practice of law, is there anything as a seller's agent that you would recommend? Uh, uh, those agents have uh, or have a conversation with the sellers about any anything that that um, they should mention uh, or just warn sellers of uh, in, in your opinion well I think the same thing I, I, I think the same thing I think you, you you need you know I'm just in seeing these systems uh, built and purchased and and you know we actually uh, have a law in Congress which uh, just got filed very, very recently, I think within the last week or so, uh, and it probably has zero chance of ever getting off the ground uh, in Washington, but we actually have a law that has passed that says, you know, we're not going to, if you're selling these camera systems for people's homes, you need to disclose on the box this particular label that says this thing records audio. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know where that's going to turn and how that's going to turn out, to be honest with you. I kind of don't think it'll pass because it's it's kind of a small bill, but it's interesting and I, th I think that that um, you know the the home installation where they're doing it the, doing it themselves is probably what you need to be looking for because that's where people when they run afoul of the law that's where they run afoul. So you need to ask, and I think it's just good questions. Tell me about your security system. Well, I just have an alarm. Okay, do you have any cameras? Yeah, I do, and they're here and here and here. All right, do you have any um, um, uh, do you have any uh, uh, you know, audio recordings, do you have ring doorbells? I mean, get those questions and answers and, and be more particularly concerned about audio. Not to be, you know, not concerned about the videos, but I, mean, I think you should be. But um, um, uh, be concerned about, about the, uh, be, be concerned about the audio and take a good look around the, around the house. We, uh, I'll say we had a case just very recently from a very well-to-do condominium here in uh, high rise uh, in Dallas where a uh, um, uh, guy was basically kicked out of the condo and we uh, the owners went in and not only found a uh, the remnants of a camera but found a two-way mirror that had been installed in a shared bathroom oh, and um, I'm, yeah i'm sure there was all sorts of legal implications and i think even the police were called and i think the gentleman would or whoever had done it was long out of the picture now but but uh, uh, but you know I mean you, you need to you know you need to look around and see all those things and be able to explain why that is and 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 ask them. But you know it's going to be and even in that one it's always the home amateur installations that are going to be the problem, never the professional. So very rarely. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, this will probably be the, the last question um, that, that we have uh, for you. Uh, so I've been getting several questions here about. Uh, the expectation of privacy outside of a property. Um, I know you you touched on this, you talked about it, but if if it's possible just to kind of summarize your thoughts on the expectation of privacy outside of a property once more. Sure. Yeah, I think that um, you know, do you have a subjective expectation outside? Well, he, here, you know, let, let's talk. I'm thinking about the majority of you here. You know, obviously, if you're showing a, a condo in a city and you walk out down, outside to the Dallas. Uh, sidewalk, you probably don't have much. Downtown Dallas sidewalk, you probably don't have a whole hell of a lot of uh, expectation of privacy right there. But most of you probably are dealing with homes that are in uh, urban sprawl, you know, and, and, and subdivisions. And, you know, again, it's not a real clear cut answer. I do, I don't know that you have that expectation of privacy when you're talking loudly in the front lawn and a neighbor overhears you. Um, uh, I do think that if you're using a recorder to make a recording, I think that's a different issue. Uh, because because you know you, 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 your buyer did not necessarily know that he would be recorded. He had a subjective belief that the outside uh, in this neighborhood at 10 a.m. on a working day when everybody's in school or work is probably pretty private. Um, now that changes a little bit when you get to the backyard, right? We kind of think our backyard's private, and and um, um, and we we went through those windows cases. You know, sometimes you can look in the backyard or into a window, and it's okay, and sometimes you can't. Uh, there's a there's a famous uh, um, case here in Texas. It's very old. That guys are uh, some uh, I think it was TXU or you know, you know some uh, electrical guys were working out and uh, next to a house and looked over a six foot fence 
and saw somebody in the backyard and they got upset and tried to sue TXU. And the court said, well, yeah, you know, that was, that's fine. You can do that. Why? Because, you know, the way the house was leveled and, and uh, the fact that everybody who kind of was on that street, public street could see back there and over here, what was going on, that's okay. But if the, you know, but if it would have been a, a 15 foot privacy fence with the, uh, uh, you know, on a on a large lot of land, maybe not so much. So these are really judgment calls. I mean, I hate to say it, but they are judgment calls by the courts. And as I've you know, shown you here, a lot of times they don't come out the same. A lot of times they fight each other and and they come out differently. And so it's going to really matter on your factual you know factual deal. But I would say that you know, look, if you're on a large piece of property in your backyard, and you know it's purposefully where you know, the neighbors can't see, and then yeah, you're it, that's you're probably going to have some expectation of privacy there. So you know that's probably protected. But if it's outside the home, uh, in the front yard, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you do have that much of an expectation of privacy if the neighbor walks out and overhears that you guys really didn't like the house, and they go and tell the seller they don't like the house because of X, Y, and Z. Well, thank you. Um, that is great information, Wes. Thank you for, for being with us today, and thank you everyone on the line here for joining us. Um, our next legal series webinar, I'll plug it uh, here, is scheduled for December 11th. We'll be joined by representatives of SEMA who will discuss what agencies can know about flooding. Um, stay tuned for details about that. But again, thank you, Wes, and thank you, everyone. Uh, until next time. Appreciate it. Thank you.